afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for the Mississippi Medical Cannabis Update. So today I have with me three esteemed colleagues. Um, I have Colleen Mitchell from Vicente, Dee Hobbs, and Ben West from Harris Shelton, which is our local Mississippi council. My law firm, Vicente, is a national cannabis and psychedelics law firm. Um, we have been helping clients over a decade write laws. Um, we change the laws in state. We were very instrumental in legalizing the state of Colorado. Um, and since then, have we been going state to state, helping people get licensed. We quarterback the entire process. Um, and we also work with clients to get their businesses started, corporate real estate work. Um, and we also have an in-house economist who can um, go over numbers with you, put together a pro forma, and help you when you're in that, that integral part of the process during your raise and talking to investors. I am joined today by Harris Shelton, which is a Southern law firm located in Mississippi and Tennessee. Harris Shelton has been um, our co-counsel in Mississippi. They have been our eyes on the ground and boots on the ground, helping with everything from corporate work, to um, you know, administrative hearings. And um, we're just very excited to be here today with you. We worked together to get the first Mississippi licensee licensed um, at the beginning of the program. And we continue to take on clients to help them participate in this new industry. Next slide, please. Quick overview of what we'll be talking about, a, a little map. Um, I'm going to start with just a quick national cannabis update, and then we're going to slip into um, an overview of where the Mississippi market sits today. And then we're going to discuss licensing and compliance, and we're going to go over what we're getting a lot of calls, calls about, which are the new rule updates that were released earlier this year to really streamline the program. And then we're going to hand things over to Harris Shelton to talk about um, opportunities, maybe how they're addressing some issues that, that have popped up, and um, the five best ways, steps to, to get started in this program. And at the end, we'll try to save some time for some questions for our participants. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I always like to jump things off with a big overview of where the state we're discussing is in this process. Um, as you can see, we have 38 states in the US who have voted or changed legis legislatively to um, legalize the medical use of marijuana. Um, next slide, please. And then we have 23 states, and that includes Ohio that just went adult use last week, who have taken that reasonable step to legalize adult use marijuana in their state. Um, I've been using these slides for years when I present, and it's it's a testament to how fast things are moving. Um, every few months, we have to update these, sometimes several times in a month, um, to reflect more and more states who are taking that step to legalize adult use and medical use marijuana. Next slide, please. We would be remiss without telling you, of course, that while many states have taken the step to regulate marijuana, it is still illegal um, at the federal level. And for this discussion, I'm gonna switch things over to Ben with Harris Shelton. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, and I know that this is a local update on Mississippi law, but as we do the federal overview, there's really nothing more impactful uh, pending from a policy perspective, what's going on, what's going to affect uh, businesses in Mississippi than the review of the scheduling of cannabis under federal law. And so it's, uh, I think as everybody here knows, uh, cannabis is Schedule One, which means the federal government has determined it should be classified with drugs like heroin, LSD, MDMA. And as I'm sure everybody also knows, President Biden has announced several occasions that uh, some policy initiatives that are important to his administration uh, are the reconsideration of that scheduling, because that's really step one um, in changing how the federal government views, regulates, uh, enforces against um, cannabis. Um, in, in their related activities. And so uh, the, the, in October of 2022, uh, President Biden uh, gave a directive 
to the DOJ and the uh, HS, HHS department, the DEA and the FDA, the, the uh, groups under their purview to review the classification of cannabis under the Controlled Substance Act. And so uh, the way it, it, it sort of works under the framework is that the FDA makes a recommendation to the DEA that the DEA then re reviews and decides whether it's going to adopt the recommendation or not. And so the, the big recent development was that on August 29th of 2023, uh, the recommendation came down from the FDA to the DEA that marijuana should be moved to Schedule 3. Now, there had been a lot of push within the industry to have marijuana descheduled, cannabis descheduled, but realistically, this was always the most likely uh, outcome and it is going to provide, um, if it continues to progress through the Administrative Procedures Act, um, it, it's going to provide a substantial amount of relief for cannabis businesses. Um, and, and the main reason for that is that, as again, as I'm sure all you guys know, you know Section 280E of the tax code uh, prohibits uh, cannabis businesses from being able to take ordinary business deductions. And so that is you know, crushing the, the profit lines, basically. You've got effective tax rates as high as 40 to 80 percent as compared to the corporate tax rate of 21%. And so, you know, let's kind of go real quick. I'll talk about where we are and what's got to happen next. And so what's got to happen next is the DEA has to uh, issue a proposed rule um, based on the FDA recommendation, which then is open to a comment and hearing period, which um, there's there's going to be comment and there's going to be hearing because as much as we would like to see this stuff uh, rescheduled, there are law enforcement groups and other groups that are you know pushing to keep it as Schedule One. I think um, it's between eight and ten of the last uh, heads of the DEA and the the drug czars for both uh, administrations of both parties, you know, are opposing this. So I, so I don't I think even though um, public sentiment and uh, the president's own policy statements are, are, are moving in the right direction. Um, it's it's still not a given and something that that has to be tracked and, and monitored. But the the good news is the DEA has never uh, gone against an FDA recommendation on scheduling. Um, and so you know what what the DEA is going to look at is an eight factor test. Um, as it determines the scheduling and, and, and just some of these, I'll try to go through them real briefly, um, our actual or relative potential for abuse, scientific evidence of pharma, pharmacological effect, um, state of current scientific knowledge, history and current pattern of, of abuse, and what the DEA, there, there have been previous uh, instances in which the, the FDA and DEA have both uh, recommended that cannabis stay on Schedule One, and they have typically determined that on based on abuse factors and no accepted medical use. And as we've kind of come to understand, those are not really scientific fact-based determinations. Those are almost uh, those are determinations based on societal pressures. Um, and as we see things are trending in the right direction. Um, in the way that the federal government uh, views it. But but one thing that's, uh, one reason the federal government and, and other and parts of the federal government are resistant to the change, the, the administrative agencies, is that, that, that they're, they've institutionalized this framework of sketch, cannabis schedule one. And so if they change that, they're going to have to modify a lot of their enforcement procedures. They're going to have to reevaluate their budget. Maybe they get less budget. They, they'd they like to keep their budget like most federal agencies. And so, again, you know, it's, it's, it's not a given. There's going to be pushback within the government. And I think things are, but I think things are trending in the right direction. And you uh, hear uh, the past most recent head of the FDA, uh, his opinion is that, the DEA is going to issue the proposed rule to move cannabis to Schedule 3 uh, before the next election. And so that will be some significant progress. 
Um, and again, you know, just to kind of highlight again the importance of that, um, that that's going to allow your standard business deductions. So things that are not strictly cost of goods sold, all the uh, you know costs that go in uh, to the employees, things of that nature, you'll be able to take those deductions. It will really increase the profitability and the profit margins of the business and give them a chance to succeed on a level playing field. And then just one last comment um, as it relates to locally to the Mississippi market is that the Schedule 1 justifies a lot of the restrictions on advertising and other things that are used um, to, to, again, have cannabis you know, be treated differently from other, uh, other drugs, basically. Um, and there's been a recently, I think yesterday or the day before, a lawsuit was filed in Mississippi where a local uh, business is challenging some of the limitations under the Mississippi law to advertising in federal court. And so it'll be uh, interesting to, to kind of track that and see how that plays out. Uh, locally, it, since we'll have some, you know, application of uh, constitutional principles and federal law to to the state uh, regulatory framework that is in place. And with that, I will go ahead and kick it back to Sally. Thanks so much. And can we go forward a couple slides, please? All right. So, um, Jumping back into Mississippi, I'm just going to talk about where the market is today, just kind of a brief snap, snapshot of where we are, and then I'll pass it over to Colleen to talk about compliance and licensing. Um, as discussed, Mississippi was on that first map with medical only, um, and what I think is really critical for people who are interested in Mississippi to understand Compared to other states, it's a really big deal that Mississippi made the policy decision not to um, cap licenses at the state level. So they did not place a limit on that. So um, where other states, um, you have to do, um, you have to apply for a competitive process, sometimes spending a quarter million dollars on, on the application, creating these teams, waiting a year or so to hear back, hear back if you even got it, and then seeing a bunch of lawsuits for those who weren't able to get it. We don't have that in Mississippi. Instead, it's a very simple, streamlined application, very straightforward. Um, and you, they had, I think it's like a month turnaround to hear whether you get licensed or not. So um, it's the only place in the South, only state in the South that is allowing such open licensing structure. Another unique aspect of, of Mississippi is that it allows for horizontal. So say in Florida, where they have vertical integration that is required, where someone has to grow it, sell it, transport it, process it all under one company. In Mississippi, you can specialize in just one aspect of the operation. So you can just open a cultivation or just be a transporter. I mean, that makes the barriers of, to entry really lower and more affordable and allows more of the mom and pops to pop up. Next slide, please. So a bit, a little timeline, because I think this is interesting. And for those of us paying attention up until now, it was a bit of a train wreck at first, even though we were all nail biters at first. Um, back in November 2020, Initiative 65, which legalized medical marijuana in Mississippi, was voted by 74 percent of the of the Mississippi voters. That number is unheard of, incredibly high and certainly not something we were thought we would see in the South. So very exciting news. It really sent ripples throughout the entire national industry. Um, unfortunately, the Mississippi Supreme Court did overturn that, but in Mississippi, the legislature jumped on things and quickly got a medical marijuana bill in place and passed it in January of 2022. Um, a lot of drama around that, but it was it was very exciting, and um, I was very proud of them to to do that where the Mississippi Supreme Court failed failed the voters. Um, just six months later, you were allowed to apply. And then we had first sales beginning earlier this year in January of 2023. Next slide, please. You can specialize, as I noted, cultivation, processing, testing, research, and retail. And there's also a transportation license as well. Next slide, please. 
Um, another big discussion point is how many patients, you know, you have people signing up for dispensaries, people growing flour and processing oils for, for patients to purchase, but who is going to be buying these? At, very, at the very beginning of the, um, the program, patient numbers were low. I think that's, that's pretty interesting. That's usually what we see when people are trying to figure out, like, how are we going to take patients who might have been buying from the black market and pull them into the regulated market? Um, but we were successful now. The numbers are very robust. They're where we thought we, they would be at this point. We're around 33,000. We got that number last week. Um, and we're expecting to see that patient number double by this time next year. At the bottom of the screen here, we listed how many licenses of each type are issued as of today. I think this is a couple weeks old, so we might be a little off, um, but it's a good indicator of um, the competition within each of those um, license types. Next slide, please. Where are these dispensaries located? You know, the, the law did allow cities and counties to ban um, these businesses within their borders. Um, that's often something we see in most states. They, they want to make sure that people have control over where these go. Um, so that was allowed by, um, by the law. And a lot of cities and counties did ban. Um, but hopefully, Many are going to change their mind. I've heard some rumblings that some of the um, some exciting counties will be changing their mind in cities and will be allowing dispensaries. Um, as you see by this map, um, the darker colors are where more dispensaries are located. Of course, we expected to see around Jackson um, and Hines County, and then at the bottom with Hancock and Harrison and Jackson counties along the the um, the border there. That's that's also pretty um, pretty much what we expected to see. Um, next slide, please. And our in-house economists put this together, um, as we discussed earlier with the patient counts, um, you know, at 2023 there with uh, 30, almost 37,000. Um, next year, by this time, we're expecting that to double to around 60. And then we should have, um, at the long and the bottom, you see the market, market projections. Um, I, th I think that's really indicative of what a robust market this will be, even though the po population in Mississippi is not too high compared to some other states. Next slide, please. And finally, who is in charge of all this stuff? So um, in D Mississippi, they decided that to bring in two different departments. The Department of Health is going to be your licensing and regulatory agency for all license types, except for dispensaries. They put those under the Department of Revenue. So when you are putting together your application, these are the agencies you'll be working with. Next slide, please. All right, I'll hand it over to Colleen with Vicente in our Denver office. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Colleen. Thanks, Sally, for the introduction. Um, I work on our merit licensing team as a project manager, and I've worked on a host of Mississippi applications since uh, the program initiated last summer from dispensary, cultivation, and processing. And I'm going to share some of the lessons that I've learned uh, from my experience helping clients, as well as some considerations for compliance once you get started. Um, so to kick things off, I'm going to talk about the licensing considerations for all license types. Um, you're going to have to disclose 100% of the ownership. So this includes all owners over 10% financial interest. Um, if your applicant entity is owned by another entity, you will still have to disclose all owners over 10%. Um, and those individuals will have to do background checks. Um, this involves getting your fingerprints taken at a local police station and sending your prints off to the Department of Health, and they'll verify that you don't have any of the disqualifying felony offenses. Um, all the owners are also going to have to provide evidence that any professional licenses they hold are currently in good standing. Um, as far as the property requirements go, this is kind of the bulk of the requirements um, and one of the most challenging aspects of the licensing process. Um, you're going to have to establish site control with a deed, a lease, or an LOI that's contingent on licensure. Um, it's really important with your site control to make sure that one, your landlord knows that you're using the property for a cannabis business. And two, that the proper cannabis language is included in your uh, site control documentation. Our team, including Sally, is 
are really great for assisting with this kind of work, reviewing leases, drafting leases, and making sure that the appropriate language is included to cover all your operations and make sure they're in compliance with the law. You're also gonna have to provide a distance survey drafted by a professional Mississippi licensed surveyor. I'm gonna discuss the specific distance requirements in the next slide. Um, and then you're also gonna have to provide site and floor plans. These do not have to be drafted by a professional architect. However, they do need to demonstrate the size dimensions of each room, of the function of each room, as well as the security requirements. So I do suggest having your architect or contractor do these plans. And if you have a security contractor, having them do a security overlay. Um, these last two bullets are some of the most important aspects of licensing, but they're also some of the most forgotten aspects. Um, the local zoning is probably gonna be your first step once you find a property that you're considering for your operations. Um, and the first step is going to be figuring out if your property is in compliance with the local zoning regulations. Um, now this can often be more challenging for dispensaries because local governments will restrict dispensaries to certain commercial zones, whereas cultivation and processing are usually permitted in agricultural or industrial zones. Um, and you don't want to sign a lease or submit your application without verifying in writing from your local government that your location is approved. I have witnessed um, companies that have gotten the state license, paid the license fee, um, and then they were out of compliance with their local government, so they could not operate at the facility that they got licensed. And the state is not gonna check this for you. So you need to call your local government and speak with the zoning official, figure out the process to get the approval in writing. Uh, same goes for the local permits. Each locality is gonna have a different, um, different requirements for what permits are required. Dispensaries will all need to get a local privilege license, which is just a business license. If you're doing construction, you'll have to get a building permit. And then some localities will require a cannabis specific permit that often uh, shares the requirements of the state licensing process. So they might require you to provide floor plans or an operating plan. And it's very important to understand these requirements off the bat and not, you know, down the line when you've already started, you know, building out your facility. Um, so when you find a location that you um, are liking for your operations, the first step would be to make an appointment with your local officials. This could be the local zoning official, the mayor, whoever's really in charge of their cannabis licensing. Go in person and sit down with them. Um, it goes very far to put a face to the name. And a lot of local governments in Mississippi have been very hesitant to work with cannabis companies. A lot of times they're confused on the state requirements. And it really does go a long way to put a face to the name and show that you are committed to being a compliant operator in their locality. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there are property setbacks for all facilities. Uh, all facilities are going to have to be a thousand feet away from a school, church, or child care facility. However, you can get a waiver that um, will allow you to be located over 500 feet but within a thousand feet from one of these facilities. Um, and then for dispensaries, they will have to be 1500 feet away from each other. So this does make it pretty challenging to find a dispensary property when you consider this, the thousand foot setback, the 1500 foot setback, as well as the local zoning restrictions. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Um, so as kind of an overview of the dispensary application requirements, overall, the dispensary applications are a bit easier um, and less intensive than the cultivation and processing requirements. Um, the ownership restriction is that no individual or entity can have interest in more than five dispensaries. Um, and all dispensary applicants are going to have to get a tax permit for their entity. Now, this can take a couple weeks. So as soon as you have your applicant entity set up, I suggest uh, starting the sales tax permit process. Um, and then as I mentioned, the property has to be at least 1500 feet away from another dispensary. 
uh, the DOR has posted a list that they update weekly with all the licensed dispensaries in the state along with their addresses. So in addition to checking your local zoning compliance, that should be the other first thing you check um, when you're looking at a, your property along with the thousand foot setback from schools and daycares. And I'll add that if you are not located in Mississippi, it is very beneficial to have somebody go in person and look at your property because using Google Maps, this is based off my experience, a lot of times Google Maps is outdated, especially in smaller towns. So there can be daycares that either don't show up on Google Maps or they're showing up on Google Maps, but they're not actually there. So it's very important to go in person. Um, and then for the application requirements, in addition to the ownership disclosures, uh, disclosures and property documentation, you're going to need to provide an operating plan and security plan that kind of covers your um, planned operations and demonstrates compliance with all the regulations. Uh, next slide, please. For cultivation and processing applications, um, the ownership restriction is that no individual or entity can have economic interest in more than one processor and cultivation cultivation license. However, this does permit uh, operators to have a duly licensed cultivation and processing facility. This is permitted. Um, there also used to be a requirement that all that 35% of the owners for these licenses were Mississippi residents, but that expired in January. Um, however, for micro cultivation and processor licenses, those do have to be owned 100% by Mississippi residents and they require you to demonstrate at least three years of residency. Um, the application requirements are a bit more intense than the dispensary application requirements. In addition to the operating plan and security plan, you've got some other narratives as well as a host of SOPs that detail all your planned operations, including your specific cultivation and processing methods. Um, my team has a host of, we've drafted many of these narratives. And if you are interested in applying, um, we can make this process very easy as far as the drafting process. I know it kind of seems daunting looking at all those requirements, but um, it's really pretty simple. So the other requirements for cultivation and processing facilities that are a bit unique are you have to provide Proof of liability insurance, however, this is not anywhere in the rules or the law, and so there's no set amount you need to, need to prove. You just need to provide a quote that shows you will have liability insurance. Similarly, you have to show financial source agreements, however, there's no set amount that you need to show. So this can be accomplished by an attestation or an attestation with a bank statement, showing that you know the applicant entity has a source of funds. I would not suggest showing you know one dollar, but you don't have to show a million dollars. And then for processing facilities, if you're planning on manufacturing edibles, you will need to also get a food permit from the Department of Health. Um, and this food permit process is a bit time consuming. You're going to need to draft more SOPs that demonstrate compliance with good manufacturing practices. And you're also going to have to provide mock-ups of your packaging and labeling, ingredients lists, and comply with an in-person inspection of your facility. So if you are a prospective processor applicant, I would suggest submitting your state application and checking no on the manufacturing edibles so that you don't have to provide the food permit at the time of application, and then work on um, drafting those requirements and applying for the food permit while you wait for your manufacturing license and then while you build out your facility because you won't be able to get it until your facility is built out and they can come inspect it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm gonna highlight some of the new rules that have been uh, released by the Department of Health. They actually went into effect yesterday um, this is not all the rules, so if you're interested in a more comprehensive overview, overview, please reach out to our team and we can send over some more information. Um, some highlights, though, of the new rules are that they've added some requirements for the site and floor plans. This includes images of the entire interior and exterior of the premise, as well as the disclosure of all the security cameras 
they were already requiring the cameras anyways, but they have clarified that in the rules. They've also added some, some requirements to the operating plan to disclose a little bit more information about the owners, including their experience and an org chart. Um, they've also added some license renewal requirements to provide, you know, updated SOPs and some other information. Um, and they've clarified procedures for terminating a license, which they previously this was not included in the rules. Um, they've also added some additional requirements for the commencement inspection, which I will talk about in the next slide. Um, this was already a policy of both the DOR and Department of Health, but it was not codified in the rules. Um, so they've added clarity on that. And then they've also added a host of requirements that are all in line with good manufacturing practices. Um, this is pretty standard content for, you know, agricultural and manufacturing facilities um, in regard to quality assurance procedures and sanitation requirements, but they've all kind of clarified it more in the rules. Um, they've also added clarification to the facility visitation policies and procedures, which are pretty much in line with industry standards. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm gonna talk about some operational compliance um, and some considerations right after you get licensed in those first few days. And this is for all license types. So the first thing you're gonna have to do is set up your metric account. Um, sorry, one person has to set up the account. This could be any of the owners. Um, and all they have to do is put in their license number after they have received the license from the department, complete the training course, which I think is a couple hours long, and then enter their work permit number. Uh, the work permit is the other requirement that all owners and employees are going to have to do. Um, this is a pretty easy process. You apply through the same portal as for the other applications, and you're just required to upload your background check, attestation, your ID. Um, and so for owners who have already done the background check, this is a pretty simple process. You'll get approved within a couple days. Um, but for other employees, it might take a few more days. Um, and then the overall employee training requirements is eight hours of initial training and then five hours of training annually. Now, the metric training is included within this eight hours, and the DOR has also posted some guidance that can count towards this training. Um, however, the cultivation and processing employees are going to have to fill in everything aside from the metric training themselves. Um, there's also opportunities, though, to contract with companies that do cannabis industry training, um, and we're happy to make referrals there if you're interested in, um, you know, hiring a third party to do your employee training. Um, the last thing that you're going to need to do before you get licensed is the commencement inspection. Um, now, both the DOR and Department of Health do these inspections, and it's mainly to ensure your compliance with inventory tracking and security requirements. So they're going to come and check all your access control features, your surveillance cameras, alarm system, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then this is the last thing I'm going to discuss today. These are some dispensary specific compliance considerations that I've gleaned from some of my operational clients. Um, one area where I think some dispensaries are struggling with their compliance is with the purchase limits. So I've got the purchase limits detailed on the slide here. Um, however, I've heard that the inventory tracking system, if you use, you know, a POS system that's integrated with metric can be, um, can have some lagging. So it's very important to have strong SOPs in place to safeguard against these technical issues and ensure that all your employees are conducting sales in compliance with these purchase limits. Um, another thing that I'm really excited to talk about is the adult use topical sales. Mississippi is the only medical state in the country that allows for adult use topical sales to people over 21. Um, and this represents a really great opportunity for Mississippi dispensaries to expand their patient base, as well as the patients involved in the program, because you know, you might get some more people into your dispensary. And since there's not very many rules on this, um, 
there's a lot of flexibility in how you can conduct these sales. So when you're conducting sales, I've included the specific code that you need to enter into metric. And you would also use this for any medical patients as well so that the topicals don't count against their purchase limit. Um, our team has a lot of experience developing SOPs specifically for these two considerations. And if you are a new dispensary or you've been licensed for a while and need some help with your compliance, please reach out to our team and we will assist. Um, I think that kind of wraps up everything that I wanted to discuss today. Um, so please reach out if you have any questions or would like our assistance with licensing in Mississippi. Thanks. Thanks so much, Colleen. And now we are going to pass the baton over to D. Hobbs. Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm D. Hobbs. I'm in, we're in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, we've been working with Vicente for over two years now. Um, personally, I was involved. Well, I'm a, I've been practicing about 20 years. Real estate, corporate contracts, mainly. When the ballot initiative <clears throat> looked like it was possibly going to pass, I got involved uh, with a, a statewide lobbying group called Initiative 65, uh, which was the group that pushed to get it on the on the ballot. That resulted in 74% of Mississippians approving uh, medical marijuana uh, statewide, with the, with the caveat that um, local. Cities and counties can opt out, and have, some have opted out, but uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But others are, are opting in back in within the next year, we believe. Uh, we've represented six to seven different clients. Um, some are really large, some are small, you know, more mom and pop ish. Uh, we have worked with Vicente to obtain over. 25 licenses from dispensaries to grows to processing. Um, and we've been pretty, pretty efficient at it. Um, we, you know, it's the deep South, right? For you, for you participants that are not in Mississippi already or from other states, um, as you could imagine, there is a little bit of good old boy politics at the local level. And I, some of the things I'm going to talk about are not in the act and they're not necessarily in the regulations, but I'm giving y'all sort of what's really going on on the ground uh, in, in the market in Mississippi and where we think it is going. Uh, we have had to go to board of supervisor meetings for the for counties, uh, board of auditor meetings for cities on behalf of clients to fight. Um, to push back against localities that were giving clients a hard time and they they themselves were not following the act, you know, the Mississippi Medical Cannabis Act, which such act specifically says uh, cities and counties cannot pass any uh, ordinance or regulation to attempt to usurp the actual act. And so we have had instances where we've had to do that. We've seen instances where we go to talk to local um, city and county attorneys to try to, you know, be a little upfront, say, hey, our client's coming, here's what our plans are. And we've actually had said plans stolen by local uh, attorneys in some small towns in Mississippi. I don't think that's going to happen again, but but that kind of stuff has, has occurred. So if y'all need help with that kind of stuff, definitely call on us. Uh, we, we, we covered the entire state for these hearings and, and dealing with the local jurisdictions where we know people in almost every jurisdiction uh, and within the state. Um, I've got a bullet point on here about you know future operators should consider processing, testing, transportation, and dispensing licenses. And I'm not trying to discourage people from looking at potential grow licenses it's just that so many grow licenses were obtained for really large grows in the state and coming out of the gate, there was a, just like most states, probably there was a lot of cannabis on the market. So the price 
that the growers can charge to processors and ultimately to the dispensaries is pretty low right now. That is going to get better as the patient count goes up. Colleen's talked about some things to help that patient count go up. And I'm gonna talk about some things that will help that as well. So I'm not trying to discourage people from looking at um, grow licenses or getting into the grow part of the business. It's just that I, I believe, I know that those are the, the grows are, are the ones struggling the most right now. Uh, but that again, that'll change. I believe that the margins right now, unlike most states, are in dispensaries and in processing. Um, 280E really kills your margins, as Ben and Colleen referenced earlier. Uh, your effective tax rate as a dispensary can be 85%. Once 280E goes away, your effective tax rate as a dispensary is going to be just like any other non-cannabis business. Uh, and hopefully that happens you know, next year sometime based on that procedure that Ben discussed earlier uh, with the DEA's interplay with the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, there are, I'm not going to say specifically which counties that are kind of key in Mississippi, but I strongly believe that a few counties and a few municipalities that are close to metropolitan or in metropolitan areas are going to opt back in. The way it worked at the beginning was if a city or county wanted to opt out of the cannabis program to disallow it, they had to, the board, the board of aldermen or the board of supervisors had 60 days from the passage of the act to get their act to, pardon the pun, but to get their act together and to vote for their city or their county to opt out. They, under the act, they can opt back in at any time. We believe in 2024, some, some very big counties and cities are gonna opt back in. That will help the patient count. Um, this sounds, I guess, a bit immature, but from what we've learned from our, some of Vicente's economists and from some of our clients, patient counts go up when, patient, when, when, when Mississippians drive by and see a dispensary near their neighborhood or near their place of work. It, they think, oh shoot, it's right there. I'm going to go get a. I'm going to get a car. Things like that drive up the patient numbers. Um, that's that's all getting better in Mississippi. Um, along the cultivation line, we do see smaller cultivators uh, with some profit margins if they've got good product and they've done. They got good brands and they've got good bud tenders. They got good customers. You know, uh, excuse me. Good products with good brands are outperforming some of the larger cultivators right now. Um, we're seeing that, you know, on the ground right now. I'm going to get back into some of the policy stuff in a minute, but I don't want to uh, let this presentation go by without mentioning that our team has clients that were early entrants into the market. They got licensed pretty early and they had the intention of exiting relatively early as well. We have clients with dispensary licenses in the northern part of the state that have licenses tied to extremely attractive locations. Uh, we have clients with grow and processing licenses that are for sale in the northern part of the state as well. They're medium-sized grow and process licenses. Um, Anyway, that I believe those have some real value. If anybody's interested in that, reach out to me or to Sally, and we can discuss getting you in touch with, with those clients that are ready to, to exit already and that are already licensed with these great locations. Um, from the lobbying end, you know, big picture, we, you know, Mississippi hopes to go adult use slash recreational soon. Some lobbyists think that that's gonna happen in the 2024 legislative session. Based on what I know, I don't believe that. I think it'll be two to three years when Mississippi goes rec. Uh, based on talking to professionals like the economist at Vicente, once it goes rec, the, 
you know, we're not gonna have a patient count anymore, but the your, your card holders or your uh, people in a in a rec program, your, your your numbers are gonna triple, right? If not quadruple, if and when Mississippi does that. Again, I don't think they're gonna pass rec in in this next session, but if they do, it's not gonna be it won't go into effect until you know probably January one of twenty twenty five. So to keep that in mind. But the more immediate and pressing issues that we want current licensees or just patients or anybody, you know, anybody with an interest in the Mississippi market that's a Mississippi citizen, is that in, in the Mississippi market that's a Mississippi citizen, is to push on their legislators to add a couple of specific conditions to the list of conditions that allow you to get a medical card. Those the two big ones are sleep and anxiety, depression. Those are not currently on our list in Mississippi. Our governor, Tate Reeves, said he wouldn't sign off on such a bill. We need um, we need to get the legislature to to put those in and hopefully have those in in a veto-proof fashion so that the governor could not override such a change, such an, an amendment to the act. Um, the Vicente economists could tell y'all a whole lot better than I can, but just guessing, I think if you add, you know, insomnia and anxiety to the list, you're possibly doubling your, uh, your patient count uh, pretty quickly. Another issue that I'm hearing from dispensaries and from patients is we need to get rid of the, the rolling one week, six MMCU unit roll off. What does that mean? That means you can go buy six units of medical cannabis per week. So if you go in on a Thursday, if I went in this afternoon to a dispensary and bought six units, those, those don't, my units don't roll back on until next Friday. So what it does is it makes people have to go to the dispensaries you know, it makes patients have to go once a week. A lot of folks want to push to get rid of that and just have the monthly limit of 24 units per month per patient so that patients can go once or twice per month to a dispensary, get what they need, get out. Just makes it more convenient for the patient. Once that word gets out that it's more convenient, patient count's going to go up, right? Um... I've got to note, Ben didn't mention that federal lawsuit. It was filed on Tuesday by a dispensary owner in DeSoto County. Uh, he's a gentleman that does business as True Source Medical Cannabis. He's at Olive Branch. He is, basically his argument is that the, the, the limitations on the advertising, which hurts patient count, which hurts the dispensaries, which hurts the industry, the, uh, that that violates his First Amendment rights. He's getting some help uh, from some nonprofit legal entities in Mississippi. Um, that y'all keep your eye out for that. It probably won't really hit the um, the news until that case moves moves along a little more. But that got filed on Tuesday in the Northern District here in Oxford. Um, the <laughs> Again, the overall economics of the of the program, they're going to get better for every licensee and every license type as the patient count goes up. So, you know, the the in the amendments to the act that came out in March of this year that Colleen referenced earlier, um, they did make some things easier on patients. Uh, you can now do telemedicine for your renewal. You cannot do telemedicine for your initial uh, visit to your cannabis doctor, right? Or to your provider. Uh, but you can now on your follow-up, uh, which that speeds things up. It's actually cheaper, uh, better for the patient. Hopefully that increases patient count. Something I want to mention, I think there might be a couple of physicians on here that are friends of mine. Uh, physicians can now own and invest in Mississippi licensed uh, businesses and maintain their practice and they can still recommend it. They just can't steer 
uh, patients to a dispensary that they own or to a product line that they're a part of, similar to Stark or anti-kickback law. So that went in in the amendment to the act in, in March. Um, another kind of key change, previously dispensaries only had 12 months to get their, to get off the ground and get their uh, dispensaries built out and open. The legislature in the amendment, um, in the recent amendment, now allows 18 months for dispensaries to get built out and open without fear of losing their license. So they gave, gave everybody a little bit of breathing room. Everybody knows how high construction costs are right now, things like that. So that was the, the motivation there for, the, for that allowance. Um, patient cards, when you apply as a patient, it used to take 30, the, the DOH had 30 days to turn cards around or to, to give you an answer. Now they only have 10 days. So they are moving a whole lot faster. In reality, they're getting them approved in about 12 hours. The Department of Health has farmed that work out to a very large Mississippi-based CPA firm that is actually processing the applications for patients. I've heard some people say they get them in four hours after going online and filling in the information. So it is moving a lot quicker. That is great for patient counts moving up. Um, on, on this last slide, on getting started, the top five considerations for entrepreneurs. We can go to the next slide. I think it's the last slide. Um, Colleen mentioned the setbacks. You got to be a thousand feet from any church, school, or daycare. There are a ton of daycares and churches in Mississippi. So you need a professional uh, engineer, and I would recommend an attorney to make sure you're good on the setbacks for dispensaries. You got to be 1,500 feet from each other. So while we're an open market state, those two setback requirements do limit the, the real estate in which you can put uh, a dispensary. Obviously, you're going to be in a high traffic area. So you've got to, that's a very important consideration. But we can help you all with that. Community support. Some of you, uh, some of the folks on the call on, the, on this uh, presentation may be from out of state. You may have your own money, may not need capital, but I do recommend, you know, considering getting some local investors and possible local strategic investors, people that are connected in Mississippi. Some of our very successful clients so far actually have lobbyists, um, key players in certain key localities in as investors, and that helps more than you would know. Um, Again, the, the team that Vicente has is extremely impressive. Colleen is on the licensing team. Sally is on the broader corporate real estate team, part of the team. But they actually have an, a couple of economists that do a heck of a job of extrapolating data from other states near Mississippi to give us, basically give you the numbers that we showed you on one of the first few slides. Uh, it's extremely impressive. Um, they pull data from Missouri, Arkansas, you know, other Southern states that, that have similar demographics to Mississippi. So it's pretty darn accurate in my opinion. Access to capital. If y'all need, if somebody needs access to investor pools or funds, get in touch with us. We have, we have those in, those in our contacts. Once it does go from schedule one to schedule three, hopefully next year, uh, there will be a whole lot more uh, in a whole lot more investor entrance into Mississippi and other states, but that'll make it easier for a lot of people to invest in Mississippi uh, cannabis as well. Um, yeah, the compliance part, you know, on the moving forward compliance, I, I believe that, you know, it's going to be two to three years until Mississippi goes wreck. So staying compliant out of the gate, um, dealing with the Department of Revenue. Uh, they're using the ABC agents in Mississippi to enforce the rules. The ABC agents in Mississippi are used to enforcing alcohol rules. Half of what they do is go around and give out MIPs to minors at bars in the state of Mississippi. These people don't have experience with cannabis. Uh, there have been a couple of instances where they've gone and attempted to 
uh, destroy product, arrest people, things like that. And they were way out of line. They're just, they're just now learning as well. So uh, keep that in mind. We can help with those kinds of things with the, uh, with the ABC uh, and the Department of Revenue and the Department of Health. Um, Sal, Sal, do you have anything else you want to add in to kind of, kind of wrap up on? Yeah, guys, no. thank you so much for showing. We have an excellent team to help you get licensed, not only in Mississippi, but if you are interested in other states, we're happy to talk about um, any sort of expansion. We work with MSOs to mom and pops. And again, we don't just help with the cannabis and um, the cannabis kind of specific things. We we are a full service law firm and we have our on the ground help with Harris Shelton, a very established law firm in Mississippi. I've been such, an, such a pleasure to work in Mississippi. Um, it's been one of my favorite states so far. And we're here to answer any of your questions. We'll also have several of us will be at MJ Biz in a couple of weeks in Las Vegas. So reach out if you wanted to meet in person. I'd, I'd love to get some FaceTime with any of you if you're interested. I know that Dee will be there as well. Um, I look forward to working with you and please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you so much.